At WPS, we believe in unlocking potential, not just for your clients, but for practitioners too, which we've been doing for over 75 years. Today, we are going to discuss unraveling the complexities of pragmatics. As we know, there are a lot of components involved when speaking about pragmatics. Thank you for joining me today as we spend time discussing different areas of pragmatics and how to put those pieces together to give us a better overall understanding of a student's pragmatic language abilities. Just a little bit about me. My name is Laura Stevenson, and I have been a CCC SLP for over 20 years with experience in both um, Arizona and California in a variety of settings. I am a, an assessment consultant with WPS, and I welcome you to contact me for assessment suggestions and free training opportunities. Today, I want to help you get a better understanding of pragmatics. We will review how we have previously assessed pragmatic skills, as well as some of the informal methods that have generally been used. You will learn about different domains and constructs associated with pragmatics. And finally, I will introduce you to a video-based assessment that was built upon these domains and constructs. So um, before we move on to the next slide, I want you to take a moment and think about what the term pragmatics means to you. Like, how would you explain that term? So what does pragmatics mean to you? Well, to me, um, pragmatics is such a broad umbrella-like term. Pragmatic language binds together semantics, morphology, syntax, and overall language comprehension and oral expression for the purpose of effective communication. It is the final element necessary for appropriate and effective communication to occur. Along with the quotes shown here, in 2014, Norbury stated that any deficit in pragmatics results in significant disruption in the communication process. I think one of my favorite um, definition quotes is from Himes in 1971, which is shown here, which simply defines pragmatics as knowing when to say what, to whom, and how much. Um, Pruding and Kirchner in 1987 defined pragmatic language as the ability to use language in specific contexts for precise purposes. Grice from 1975 and Mundy and Marcus in 1997 make a useful contribution in pointing out that it is impossible to declare what pragmatic language is without using culture as context. It is a student's very subjective experience with social language that informs them when a speaker is being sarcastic, making an attempt at humor, or being unnecessarily formal or polite. The linguistic skills shown here in these colored boxes work cohesively to produce pragmatic language. In addition to appropriate turn-taking, politeness, topic introduction and maintenance, being able to adjust for different listeners, and being able to change direction or intention, pragmatics also includes, as we know, adequate eye contact and gaze, body language, micro expressions of the face, gestures, and other forms of nonverbal language. The environment that generates language provides context for what is communicated and what is invaluable. The intention of the speaker and the sensory motor actions used to deliver what is being said are pivotal. Knowledge shared in the communication dyad is to be considered by the speaker and the listener alike. But the context changes and shifts even further if we move from dyad to a speaker in a group setting. 
The researchers see meaning to be as important as the context, since it is the result of well-intentioned and creative combinations of utterances and social settings. Therefore, meanings and context are considered inseparable. Lucusa, Leninen, and Ryder in 2006 suggest that context can be interpreted as knowing the identity of the speaker and listener, in addition to determining the speaker's intention of sentence selection, which is used to convey meaning. Pragmatic language deficits translate into difficulty with correctly understanding and responding verbally to situations in a social context. Individuals with deficits and pragmatic language struggle primarily during conversation with others, both receptively and expressively. A major difficulty with undiagnosed pragmatic communication disorders is that due to communication difficulties, individuals may be reluctant to communicate at all. This leads to a negative spiral because reluctance halts further attempts at communication. This occurs because these individuals receive limited positive feedback in reciprocal communication, meaning that this problem is likely to continue. There is a clear need to identify students unable to comprehend or use social language adequately because without appropriate pragmatic language skills, quality communication cannot occur. When one presents with pragmatic impairment, the interlocutor is reluctant to attend to the message, whether syntactically sound or not. This concept is highly relevant in an educational context. Pragmatic language deficits adversely affect the social and academic performance of school-aged children, especially those who present with high-functioning autism and social pragmatic communication disorders. The relevance of considering pragmatic language impairment and the importance of identifying students who present with such difficulties cannot be overstated. As such, students require specialized education and support. So what skill areas have we commonly looked at when assessing pragmatics? You can take a look at this slide here, but it's body language, eye contact, conversation, initiation, maintenance and ending, making the sequence of statements coherent and logical, taking turns with other speakers and maintaining a topic. I want you to take a moment and think about the skill areas that you have commonly assessed when looking at pragmatics. Okay, so now let's think about some of the informal methods that we have used when assessing pragmatic language. So how about narrative sample, where we look at story retelling tasks, comprehension tasks. Um, let's Think about theory of mind or Tom tasks, where we consider perspective of another, of another person. How about emotional understanding tasks, where understanding of emotions based on facial expressions is looked at? How about social problem solving tasks? Here we look at reasonable solutions to presented social difficulties. And some more, how about shared attention? You guess what you're thinking or they guess what you're thinking based upon where or what you were looking at. How about double interview? You interview the student and the student interviews you. We also look at maintaining a topic. So appropriate responses to conversation starters, um, maintaining a topic for several turns, and um, finally, conversation with peers. So we look at the conversational flow. Um, can they maintain a topic that's introduced by another person? So I want you to take a moment here and think about what are some other informal methods of assessing pragmatic language that you have used.
So I, I like this picture with the puzzle pieces here because I think that we have really looked in the past that um, pragmatics have typically been assessed in isolated units that do not target specific components or domains and assessments have not shown a comprehensive profile. We know that interventions are more effective if specific deficit components are identified. So with isolated units, you do not target specific components or domains. If you only look at isolated units, will you be able to gain enough information for a really good comprehensive profile? What if we used videos? Have you used videos in the past to evaluate pragmatics? If not, think about this. If you combine the storytelling power of television with authentic, real life social situations, would your student respond in a more natural way? To date, pragmatic language skills have been broadly grouped under the umbrella of general, uh, under the general umbrella term of pragmatic. So I love that umbrella there, that picture of that umbrella. Today, we are going to talk about two broad constructs under the realm of pragmatic language skills. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to look at pragmatic judgment and pragmatic performance. We will also talk about instrumental and effective intent, as well as paralinguistic cohesion. So here is a quick look at the areas that we are going to discuss. I'm going to pause here for a moment just so you can take a look at these different domains and constructs. So let's start with pragmatic judgment. <clears throat> so pragmatic judgment is a broad construct used to measure pragmatic language skills. In 2014, according to Ryder and Leninen, pragmatic judgment is measured in terms of the ability of an individual to appropriately understand and use adequate language. This requires the individual to form appropriate social language responses, such as producing the acceptable response at the right time in a given social context. So pragmatic judgment is related to receptive pragmatic skills. Defining pragmatic judgment as equivalent to receptive pragmatic skills and distinguishing it from a broad definition of pragmatic language skills will allow a more detailed grasp of an individual's ability to understand social situations. Pragmatic performance is defined as congruent to an individual's expressive pragmatic skills and is measured through the response given in social situations. So responses include appropriate answers to questions or statements and appropriate responses to expressed emotions. Assessing appropriate responses is necessary as it pertains to daily life skills. According to Dr. Carol Wofolk in 1999, for expression, the speaker must access the system in which knowledge is stored from comprehension and find the exact word or words appropriate to express the idea accurately. Developing skills in this area is crucial and it's critical as it involves being able to engage in reciprocal communication during conversation, providing relevant information when asked questions, properly taking turns in conversation, responding appropriately to other individuals in regards to gender, status, and age, and using the appropriate language that corresponds to specific feelings such as gratitude, 
excitement and sorrow. And that's according to Ryder et al. in 2008. Receptively, this can mean identifying correct and incorrect responses in a social context. Expressively, this involves verbal, verbally providing appropriate responses in a given situation. So assessment of both pragmatic judgment and pragmatic performance is important because each individual with ASD or SLI has a different language profile. One may have a more developed judgment um, than performance in that skill area or vice versa. Measuring both skills can be a more detailed approach to understanding the pragmatic profiles of these individuals, which in turn results in a more individualized an effective intervention plan. In addition to assessing pragmatic judgment and pragmatic performance skills, it is important to also differentiate pragmatic language skills as either instrumental communication or effective non-instrumental communication. In instrumental intent, the primary goal is to relay information effectively, and here the communication is focused more on benefiting oneself. The focus is on what is being said, as opposed to effective or emotional functions. Because difficulty understanding others' emotions and perspective is a highlighted characteristic in individuals with ASD and SLI, instrumental communication is often used. This is critical in the assessment of such individuals. As Dr. Carol Wolfolk in 1999 cites Bates 1976 argument that the ability to explain pragmatic analysis seems to develop apart from passive pragmatic comprehension and pragmatic expression. Whereas non-instrumental communication or effective communication involves higher level communication skills, such as expressing emotions to another person, you can talk about like joy or sorrow, non-instrumental communication or effective intent is a key component of non-verbal communication and also requires higher level thought processing. Again, in 1999, Dr. Carol Wolfolk discussed how this metacognitive ability requires more than simply engaging in comprehension and production of pragmatically acceptable communication. Non-instrumental communication or effective intent differs from instrumental communication and that it is not used merely as a means to an end. Effective intent can be viewed as pertinent construct as a pertinent construct in assessing pragmatic language skills, as its use demonstrates aptitude, <clears throat> excuse me, as its use demonstrates aptitude in both pragmatic judgment and pragmatic performance skills. In 2009, Tessink et al. defines pragmatics as the ability to use and comprehend language in context. Some standardized assessments in the field frequently define pragmatics. However, the definition of paralinguistics and specifically how paralinguistics is affected among those with pragmatic language impairment is scarce. Before we move on to the next slide, take a moment and think about how you would define paralinguistics. Is this a newer term for you? Have you used this term in the past? If so, what does it mean to you? If not, don't worry, we will discuss this item further on the next slide. So what is paralinguistics? Body language, gestures, facial expressions, tone and pitch of voice, 
are all examples of paralinguistic features. Paralinguistic features of language are extremely important as they can change the message completely. Paralanguage includes the non-language elements of language, of speech, um, such as your talking speed. So for an example, you might speak quickly if you are excited about something. Um, and I may be speaking quickly during this presentation because I love to talk about pragmatics. So maybe I'm speaking um, a little bit more quickly. In 2007, Liz Combe defined paralinguistics in the general sense as nonverbal communication in human interaction. So this definition is embedded in the definition of paralinguistic cohesion, which is the integrative interaction between an individual's ability to detect a speaker's intent by recognizing meanings of various nonverbal cues and his or her ability to express various types of intent with the help of nonverbal signals, such as facial expressions, tone of voice, inflections and prosody, gestures, and overall body language. It is the final element of communication and arguably the most critical for communicating emotions such as anger, stress, and happiness. All right, so we have discussed the different pragmatic domains. Now let's learn about six different constructs. So we are going to begin with instrumental performance appraisal, which addresses the awareness of basic social routines. Instrumental performance appraisal examines the ability to judge appropriateness of introductions, farewells, politeness, making requests, and responding to gratitude. You are going to hear some of the similar terms used in some of the other constructs. So with this one, I want you to remember that this deals with the ability to judge the appropriateness. This construct looks at an individual's ability to discern the difference between appropriate and inappropriate language when used in means end or basic communication processes. Instrumental performance appraisal skills are necessary for an individual to satisfy their basic needs and to behave appropriately in social situations. IPA or instrumental performance appraisal can be measured through the subject's ability to choose correct responses to basic or functional communication processes. Learning to distinguish correct from incorrect behaviors will consequently result in acting out correct behaviors. Research using the PECS or the Picture Exchange Communication System as a means to teach functional communication has produced effective results in the acquisition and improvement of functional skills. In 2012, Akar and Dickin reviewed studies where video modeling was used as a teaching method for students with ASD. Results conclusively found that videos were also effective in teaching social skills, play skills, language and communication skills, functional skills, self-care skills, and daily life skills to children with autism. So the second construct we're going to look at is social context appraisal. It is the effective intent of pragmatic judgment. <clears throat> so successful SCA or social context appraisal requires understanding of personal intent as well as the ability to infer what others are thinking. In SCA, we are looking at one's ability of reading context cues.
So social context appraisal represents the ability to understand the dynamic nature of a social context and adequately process the interactions between various contextual variabilities, such as physical setting and environment, communication partners, communicative intent, conflict solution, et cetera. This skill requires an ability to demonstrate perspective taking, which we know is one component of theory of mind or TOM. SCA includes interpreting components of language that are not meant to be interpreted at face value. So this is an area that individuals, some individuals with ASD may struggle with, such as irony, sarcasm, idioms, and at times humor, and at times humor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Understanding the intent of others or the receptive aspect of social context can result in an appropriate behavior or expressive response. SCA also involves interpreting social situations, settings, changes in settings, disruption of routines, and flexibility in disruption of routines. All right, moving on to construct three. So here we are talking about paralinguistic decoding. And this involves one's ability to read micro expressions and nonverbal language. So here we are looking at the ability to read nonverbal cues. Paralinguistic decoding is a form of non-instrumental communication that involves one's ability to read and understand microexpressions and nonverbal language. Nonverbal communication can be as meaningful as spoken words. It can suggest what a person is feeling and thinking without the use of words. Often, it can reveal how a person feels, although the person's verbal communication may be contradictory. An appropriate understanding of nonverbal language is critical in understanding another person. In turn, it leads to an appropriate verbal response. When we look at pragmatic performance of instrumental intent, we are addressing instrumental performance or one's ability to use social routine language. So instrumental performance looks at the ability to adequately and appropriately use introductions, farewells, and politeness, as well as to, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as to appropriately make requests, respond to gratitude, request help, answer phone calls, request information such as directions, and ask for permission. Instrumental performance is defined in the same manner as instrumental performance appraisal instead of understanding instrumental performance assesses one's ability to adequately and appropriately express or use verbal means and processes. Means end or essential communication skills are necessary as they are the building blocks for more complex language processes, such as turn taking and conversation, expression of appropriate emotion, and more generally speaking, social communication. In 2013, Luzinski and Hanley conducted a study in which preschool students were taught to request teacher attention, teacher assistance, and preferred materials. These strategies were delivered through teacher instruction, modeling, role-playing, and differential reinforcement. The taught strategies produce effective results where the stu students were able to improve their pragmatic language skills, as well as maintain and continue to apply them in the classroom. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, the skills aided in the prevention of problematic behavior. They used role-playing and modeling as opposed to pictures 
to achieve their desired use of communication and ultimately behavior. So let's take a look at pragmatic performance of effective intent or one's ability to express emotions. Effective expression or AE is a non-instrumental form of communication. Effective expression or AE looks at the ability to appropriately express polite refusal or regret, support peers, give compliments, use humor, or express empathy, gratitude, and encouragement. Effective expression requires higher level thinking because its purpose is not designed to fulfill basic needs. Children who more often make reference to emotional states do so because they possess a deeper understanding of mind and emotion. This skill crucially affects the flow of conversation and the ability to understand others' point of view. Do you think this is important when building and maintaining relationships? I would say most definitely yes, this is essential in building relationships. Um, individuals with ASD might struggle not only with the understanding of emotional cues, but also with effective expression. Studies have found that some children with autism are less likely to show positive emotion and more likely to demonstrate a flat effect. Effective expression also encompasses or can mutually affect conversational techniques, such as topic selection, maintenance, introduction, transition, and closure. Generally, a speaker is responsive to his or her conversational partner. This can be expressed through the verbal feedback or effective communication. Selection of either or both of these expressions is often changed or determined pending what the conversational partner may say. So use of effective expression or nonverbal language is a significant factor that may impact a speaker's language use. These expressions are often noted in facial expressions, body posture, tone of voice, and eye contact. These expressions in turn portray positive and negative reactions that may result in change of topic, conversation contingency and repair. A 2009 study looked at the effects of a conversational partner's <clears throat> effective expression on a speaker's language use and reported that listeners' effective expressions change a given speaker's language use. So void of language, effective expression can impact the flow of the conversation because it can be viewed as a sign of understanding or to the contrary, disapproval. Effective expression can be attributed to conversational adaptations because it requires the speaker to be flexible and responsive to the flow of the conversation. All right, last construct. So let's talk about paralinguistic signals. Paralinguistic signals is a non-instrumental form of communication used to express various communication or communicative intents. Paralinguistic signals is also a non-instrumental form of communication that involves the ability to appropriately use microexpressions, gestures, and prosody. As opposed to the third construct we discussed, which was paralinguistic decoding, paralinguistic signals can be referred to as acting out 
of micro expressions and gestures. Similar to affective expression, paralinguistic signals impact the speaker's choice of language and consequently the flow of conversation. Assessing for such, uh, such a construct is critical as it helps target specific pragmatic deficits in an individual who we may already know has general difficulty in pragmatic language. Multiple studies have examined the topic of prosody. Prosody we know is defined as the rhythm, stress, or intonation of speech. In regard to pragmatics, a speaker's tone can reveal information regarding their intent. Previous studies have revealed that some individuals with ASD have deficits in their speech prosody and prosodic comprehension and therefore have difficulty with the ability to draw inferences from a speaker's rate or tone of voice. This makes understanding idioms, metaphors, irony, and sarcasm even more difficult as the inferred meaning differs from the literal meaning. All right, <clears throat> so we have talked about the domains. We have talked about the constructs. There's a lot of information. I just want to do a really quick review of those six constructs. So I want you just to take a look at the slide. I am going to be reading the next couple of slides, so just follow along. <clears throat> so instrumental performance appraisal subtest measures awareness of basic social routines and the ability to judge their appropriateness. This includes the ability to judge appropriateness identify and understand um, or judge the appropriateness of introductions, politeness, making requests, requesting help, answering phone calls, and asking for permission. It also looks at identifying rude tone in requests, polite language, and also the understanding when interpretations are appropriate and rules of conversational turn taking. <clears throat> the social context appraisal subtest measures awareness of social cues, the ability to understand the intent of others and to infer what others are thinking. This also includes detecting nonverbal cues, understanding indirectly implied requests or statements, making appropriate inferences, and making judgments about social context when situational cues change. The paralinguistic decoding subtest measures the ability to detect a speaker's intent by recognizing meanings of various nonverbal cues, such as facial expressions, tone of voice, inflections in prosody, gestures, and overall body language. The instrumental performance subtest measures language skills that are necessary to satisfy an individual's basic needs and express communicative intent that is instrumental in nature. This includes the ability to use social routine language, such as expressing greetings, making introductions, being polite, making requests, responding to gratitude, requesting help, requesting information, and asking for permission. The effective expression subtest measures the ability to appropriately express higher order pragmatic language that is emotive in nature, such as regret, sorrow, peer support, praise, empathy, gratitude, and encouragement. The paralinguistic signal subtest measures the ability to use various nonverbal cues, such as facial expressions, tone of voice, inflections and prosody, gestures, and overall body language to express a variety of communicative intents. So a wonderful speech language pathologist 
saw a need for a different way of assessing for pragmatics. So she decided to create her own assessment tool. So WPS is now the publisher of the Clinical Assessment of Pragmatics, which is more commonly known as the CAPS. And the author of this is Dr. Adriana Lavi. The CAPS is an individually administered performance test for individuals ages seven through 18 years of age, measuring comprehensive pragmatic language skills using a video-based format. The CAPS measures judgment and performance of pragmatic language and yields scores across six areas of pragmatic skills. The CAPS uses videos for eliciting pragmatic language responses from individuals in order to analyze and measure individuals' ability to understand and respond to real life social situations. Take a moment and look at and read this graphic. I wanna quickly go over some of the key features of the CAPS. The CAPS videos display real life situations and social environments and ask the examinee to describe either what is going on or how they would respond. I want you to think about some of the other pragmatic language tests. Do any of them use hypothetical scenarios that are read aloud to the examinee? If so, do you think you would obtain the same results? The CAPS measures the examinee's understanding of social situations and their ability to express themselves in the appropriate way given a variety of situations. <clears throat> it measures verbal and nonverbal re responses, superficial social norms, and high-level emotions. The CAPS is useful for distinguishing problems in understanding and using pragmatic language, particularly in those individuals with autism and pragmatic language impairment. Some of these individuals can score within the average range on other language measures or pragmatic language tests because the individual knows what the answer should be. But when they are put into a social situation, they often cannot demonstrate this knowledge. The CAPS videos mimic actual social exchanges and identify strengths and weaknesses in higher level language expression inferential thinking, and understanding the mind of others when given verbal and nonverbal cues. The results of the CAPS test provide comprehensive information on pragmatic language skills and social language development of children and young adults. It has four essential purposes to help identify pragmatic language deficits and determine degree of deficits, to determine strengths and weaknesses, to document progress and analyze social pragmatic language skills for research purposes. Because of the importance of also using an informal assessment to look at a child's pragmatic language abilities, the CAPS offers a conversational adaptation checklist to be used. In describing an individual's pragmatic language skills, 
informal assessment looks primarily at language samples, specifically conversations. When conducted in an individual's natural environment, conversations provide the assessor with a clear understanding of the individual's abilities across all domains of communication. So we're looking at form, content, and use. When a setting differs greatly from the child's natural environment, such as while engaging with a clinician, language samples are likely not to be authentic due to the strains placed on the individual by an authoritative figure or an unfamiliar environment. The individual is unlikely to initiate conversation and may likely feel reluctant to engage in reciprocal converse, uh, communication. To acquire the clearest depiction of a child's language abilities, the most natural communication needs to be evaluated in a familiar environment. To create a naturalistic environment in which the individual feels comfortable engaging in conversation, the CAPS uses the works of Weatherby and Prezant from 1989, which focuses heavily on communication temptations as a means of elicitation. Let me grab a drink really quick. So have you heard of communication temptations before? Communication temptations are situations or scenarios that elicit communication from a child by tempting them. So a situation is created so that the child must attempt to initiate conversation, either verbally, non-verbally, or gesturally, to receive what he or she desires, to reject, to express desire for another option, et cetera. According to Snell and Lonke in 2002, such structured contexts encourage a child to initiate communication. Setting up the environment with this intention provides a greater opportunity to understand the child's communication system. Um, for suggested techniques and prompts for eliciting a conversational sample, if you have the CAPS assessment, please see the last page of the record form and you've got some great information there. So let's briefly talk about administration and scoring. Whoops. Okay, so full administration takes about 45 minutes to complete. Um, if you are administering in multiple sessions or after a break, you can go ahead and go back in and select specific subtests. But remember, you still need to select the full version at first to administer the examples um, for the subtest. So the CAPS videos are available through two different ways, either through a flash drive, or now we have the videos available digitally through our online evaluation system platform. So videos may not be repeated paraphrased or explained by the examiners, but the examiner can repeat the item question one time if it is requested. Examinees are never penalized for grammar or articulation errors. All scoring instructions are provided on the record form. And the record form is also available in the original format on the paper printed protocol. And we now also have a digital um, scoring protocol available through our online evaluation system platform. So the CAPS yields a standard score and percentile for the overall composite score and three index scores. So we have the core pragmatic language composite, which is the most accurate measure of the examinee's pragmatic competence based on the all six of the subtests. 
Then we have the pragmatic judgment index, and this is the ability to detect, comprehend, and interpret contextualized social cues. We then have the pragmatic performance index, looking at the ability to express pragmatic knowledge across contexts from simple routine social exchanges to complex emotional encounters. And finally, the pragmatic, I'm sorry, the pra <laughs> paralinguistic index, which looks at the ability to detect and interpret the intent of a speaker by recognizing nonverbal cues. So here is a look at uh, the descriptive ranges for the CAPS. So when a student performs poorly or scores poorly within a different domain, what does that mean? So let's discuss pragmatic judgment first. Examinees who score poorly in this area exhibit rigidity in their understanding of the fluidity of social situations and displays difficulty when uncertainty, variability is likely, making engagement and successful reciprocal communication at school challenging. Examinees who score poorly in the pragmatic performance struggle with using socially acceptable greetings and expressing elaborate sentiments, reducing their ability to follow expected social routines in school and to communicate their feelings throughout the day. In paralinguistics, those who score poorly exhibit reduced use of facial expressions, inappropriate use of inflection and in, in prosody across various types of communicative intent, and or reduced eye contact. All of these difficulties result in breakdowns during recipro reciprocal communication at school. Again, I want to remind everyone that we have the WPS online evaluation system platform, and please contact me for more information about that. Um, for any questions, comments, please reach out to consult at wpspublish.com. This map is a little bit hard to read, but you are able to see if you look really closely who your assessment consultant is for the state that you reside in and work in. And again, here is a look at the assessment consultant so you can put a name with a face. And quickly, some of the references that were used today. And I want to stop share and thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that this was informative and that you learned a little bit more about pragmatics. Again, thank you for joining me and have a great day.